Classes in Statistical Mechanics. Lectures by Professor George Phillies, based on his book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics, Springer Verlag, 2000. And today, this lecture is Lecture 11, Formal Quantum Mechanics Issues, Solid. I'm Professor Phillies, and these are my lectures on statistical mechanics, based on my book, Elementary Lectures in Statistical Mechanics. Today we're going to start with Chapter 12, which are formal considerations related to quantum statistical mechanics. We begin with equation 12.1, which shows the averaging process we have done all along. That is, we have a value of a variable in each state, yes, and we go through all the states, and we have the statistical weight in each state, and we compute a statistical average. Now, if we are actually doing this quantum mechanically, what has to happen is that the um, things that we are treating as mechanical variables, A sub J and E sub J, that is the thing we're averaging in the energy, become quantum mechanical operators. And in order to obtain their expectation value in each state, we do what you see in 12.2. And in 12.2, A and E have been replaced with A, the operator, H, the operator. They're sandwiched between a pair of wave of quantum states. And we do a sum over all quantum states. Um, a simple case of this occurs if the states J are all eigenstates of the energy. Because if the state J is an eigenstate of the energy, then E to the minus beta H operator simply becomes, well, you can expand e, e, e to the minus beta H operator as a Taylor series, and you get this long series of products of the Hamiltonian operator, but they're acting on something that is an eigenfunction of the energy, and so H op simply becomes the energy of that state automatically. And at that point, you have J, A operator, J, exponential minus beta E. Okay, and downstairs you have, you would have the product of J with itself, which is one, times E to the minus beta E. And it looks exactly the way it does before. Now, if you're actually doing direct quantum mechanics, the quantum states do not have to be normalized the way they do in some other states, but the models. But the lack of normalization is the same above and below and cancels. OK, so in any event, we do the averaging. Well, that's very nice, but there's an immediate problem. Suppose J is not an eigenfunction of the energy. Then you'd potentially have a real mess, don't you? Because H acts on the um, state J so far, the ket state J. And out comes this mixture of states and numbers multiplying it. And if you're doing exponential minus beta E, you get this thoroughgoing mixture of things. So what happens? How do we, how does this answer? Well, the answer is if you were just doing this for a single state J, it would get quite messy. But you aren't doing it for a single state J. You're doing it for a summation over all states of the system. Yes? Mm -hmm. G. So imagine where we set up A e to the minus beta H. And we view it as a matrix with a, a bra vector i and a ket vector j. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's a matrix. And we're taking a sum over the diagonal components of the matrix. What is a sum over all of the diagonal components of the matrix? Trace. Yes, it's a trace. So we are taking the trace of the matrix in this particular odd set of states, which we haven't specified. But what happens to the trace of the matrix if you change all of the basis vectors? What happens to the trace of the matrix if you 
replace the basis factors you were initially using with a set of basis factors that are energy eigenstates. The trace is an invariant. Okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore, whatever we did, if we use a different set of basis factors, a basis set of basis factors that is convenient for some other reason, we get exactly the same answer as if our basis factors had energy as one of their eigenvalues. So changing the set of basis factors is harmless. It has no effect on the expectation value. Well, that's sort of desirable because if the um, uh, value of the average A depended on which set of basis factors you used, you'd have to have some process for choosing that. And that might be very messy, now mightn't it? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any effect. Okay. And now we come to the point where we cheated. And the cheat is explicit in equation 12.2, and it was also explicit when I said for the um, discussion in class, let's look at the vibrational states of the system. So E equals N plus 1 half H nu is a list of the vibrational states. Yes? Do either of you see the cheat? It's actually quite subtle. Is that assuming it's vibrating in only one dimension? Um, well, no, I mean, if you had a more complicated molecule, the list of, that, of basis factors would be different. Okay. But it's, that's not the issue. The issue is, we have been saying we will add up and calculate over an ensemble. And an ensemble is a complete non-repeating list of all states of the system. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we then said we will do a sum over all basis factors, a complete set of states. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the word complete has two entirely different meanings in those two statements. The reason it has two meanings is that if one is a basis factor and two is a basis factor, then complex number times one plus complex number times 2 is a state of the system. And the complete list of all of the states of the system includes not only the pure states, yes, they're pure states, that's what the basis factors are. Mm -hmm. A complete list of all of the states of the system includes not only all of the pure states, but all of the mixed states, mm -hmm. yes? And if we want to write a sum over all of the mixed states of the system, we have to work a little harder than we did. In fact, what we have to do is to say, let's look at 12.10. Here is a simple mixed state. It's composed of only two pure states that are added with amplitudes A1 and A2 and phases phi1 and phi2. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. So suppose we want to write a sum over all of the mixed states. Well, a mixed state is going to be a sum a sub i e to the i phi sub i state i. You add over i, you add, add over the amplitude of each pure state and the amount it contributes to the mixed state. That's one state. What does the sum over all of those mixed states look like? Well, each of the phases, phi 1, phi 2, and so forth, separately can go from 0 to 2 pi. There's no point in their going further than 2 pi. It's repetitive, but they go from 0 to 2 pi. Furthermore, each of the little a's, the amplitudes, goes from 0 to 1. The statement that the number multiplying the pure state is complex uh, is in fact handled by a e to the i phi, but it's not being handled as real part plus i imaginary part. It's being handled as amplitude e to the i phase. And equation, well, object 12.11 shows the sum over all, how you generate the sum over all mixed states. 
yes, and there's a constraint, the sum of the square of the a's has to equal 1. So far, so good. So, what we then do is to say, we can write the quantum ensemble average over all states, pure and mixed, as 12.12. .12. Little n and little d stand for numerator and denominator. The reason we write them as numerator and denominator is shown as the top half of the next page where numerator and denominator are written out separately and cover several lines each. You may say, my, my that looks complicated, doesn't it? What happens? Well, I shall skip over the fine details of what happens. It's a math something that you can work through. And since I'm trying to get to the rear half of the book, we won't deal, do it in detail. But the short answer is that you can do a factor, factorization, and the factorization is shown in 12.14. And there is the sum over all pure states of the thing at the far right of the equation, j a e to the minus beta h j. Yes? And there is this monstrosity in between them, which is an integral over the potentially continuously infinite number of different amplitudes, the integral 0 to 2 pi of all of the phases, um, repeated twice. There's all this other stuff that you can see upstairs. And when you crank through it, 1213 lets you simplify it a bit. That's some number. And it's a little hard to tell what the number is. But you can check that the number is the same above and below, and therefore, whatever it is, it cancels. And because it cancels, um, 12, the ratio of the two objects above 1213 reduces to 12.17, which is what we did. That is, the sum over all states of the system reduces, after very careful work, to a sum over all of the basis factors. See it? Mm -hmm. Well, this point tends to get um, ignored, um, but it's important because we are going to be consistent. In fact, a, an ensemble average is a sum over all states of the system. Not a complete set of basis states, but all states but if you only take into account the complete set of basis states, you get the right answer. Okay? Now, what else do we discuss? Well, <clears throat> we don't really discuss, <clears throat> we will, may skip over the Kirkwood-Wigner theorem. The Kirkwood-Wigner theorem actually shows you where the 1 over n factorial h to the 3n comes from. That's an aside. Um, there is another bit, which I also footnote, and have been a little more careful with than most people are. <coughs> we are about to go back and discuss what Planck did, and solid states and quantization. We're going to do that fairly quickly, too. Uh, the main issue was as follows. Planck had the bright idea that he was going to explain the arrow of time, the notion that there is macroscopic irreversibility, which he believed in. Uh, and the basis for this was that you had an interaction between uh, harmonic oscillators and the electromagnetic field, and this somehow led to irreversibility. Now, Maxwell's equations are time reversible, so if you think about it a bit, you realize there's not much, so are the equations of motion for harmonic oscillators. There's not much hope of getting to the desired outcome from the starting point, because the desired outcome says the opposite of what he wanted. <clears throat> so he had the bright idea of doing this, and he then tried to treat an electromagnetic field in a bo box, the black box problem. And after a certain amount of effort, he calculated, well, if you look at uh, something that's glowing red or white, I don't recommend looking at the sun, but it is respectably close but not perfectly a black body. 
because it has emission lines and absorption lines, most of which are so narrow they blur out to human color vision. Um, he was able to calculate the shape of the um, emission of a black body and show that it was linear in temperature. Um, and he got the convergent integral. Somewhat later, Raleigh, who was dragged into it because he did something that's related to it, and Jeans did what they thought was the correct calculation of the um, emission of a black body and also the specific heat of the electromagnetic field in the room. You can store energy in the infrared light in the room so it has a, black, it has a specific heat. And Jeans found a little difficulty. His integrals were divergent, thus predicting that the specific heat of the radiation in this room is infinite. Now that would be very convenient if it were true. You can take all these annoying nuclear reactors and replace them with a janitor's closet you've brought up to 4,000 Kelvin somehow, because no matter how much energy you take out of the janitor's closet, it's still at 4,000 Kelvin and can continue to power your steam turbines. Uh, this does not work in the real world. Do not try it with your janitor's closet. Um, then, um, there was a period in which it wasn't quite realized there was an issue, and it took a while to figure out that the Jeans result was the correct classical result. The Planck result was not, and the question was, why did Planck get a different answer? Um, and I believe one properly credits Einstein at this point with noting that the reason things were different is that Einstein, is that Planck, when he hit this ugly integral and wanted to apply Boltzmann's statistical mechanics, said, here is the harmonic oscillator. It exchanges energy with the um, electromagnetic field. The total energy of, the, of all of the oscillators, he had lots of oscillators in the system, not just one, and that was critical. The total energy of all of the oscillators was some integer times a small amount, which happened to be linear in the frequency. So the total energy was some very large capital NH nu, but clearly, you know, it's a discrete sum rather than an integral that can't make a difference. <coughs> At some point along the way, Planck realized there was more of an issue here, and he started talking about the structure of phase space, that you had to discretize phase space in some sense, but he didn't find a path to that. He was also worried about the two new natural constants he introduced, one of which we now call the Boltzmann constant, and one of which we now call Planck's constant. But, you know, Boltzmann constant is really a units issue, um, but the, it was viewed at the time as being just as central as Planck's constant. And only um, after um, a piece was it recognized that G. Planck had introduced quantization. And there was this process of getting from point A to point B. It wasn't that Planck realized at the front end, if I quantize the energy, I solve the problem. This does not resemble what happened. Um, you will, in some undergrad and grad texts, see a, re a reference to the ultraviolet catastrophe. Mm -hmm. The ultraviolet catastrophe, which was known to Gibbs, it's described in his book, though in a very different way than most modern books do, <coughs> is the notion that the specific heat of the electromagnetic field is infinite. <coughs> This was not recognized as a threat motivating quantization because ultraviolet catastrophe was discovered after Planck discovered quantization. Okay, let us go back to chapter 11. <clears throat> and in chapter 11, we will discuss crystalline solids. Now, chapter 11 has sort of two parts, sort of several parts. And one is the notion we have a solid body. It's a bunch of masses linked by springs. And the question is how we treat its specific heat. <clears throat> well, it's an oscillator, so the simplest guess was Einstein's. These are all oscillators. They all have the same frequency nu, 
and therefore the energy of each oscillator must be nh nu for some value of n. Okay? And um, if Einstein viewed this as an advance over the original classical theory. The original classical theory said we have n particles in the system. They can each oscillate along the x, y, or z directions. So from classical mechanics, if I have n coupled harmonic oscillators that can all move in all three directions, we have 3n coupled harmonic oscillators. Yes. Therefore, we must have 3n coupled normal modes. Of course, if you've done physics one, you have or four, you have seen pairs of normal modes at most, or maybe you saw three. Well, if you have n coupled harmonic oscillators, three-dimensional, you have three n normal modes, and therefore the energy of the system can be written as seen in equation 11.1. The energy of the system is one half a q square plus b p square. Um, so there is the energy of 3n coupled harmonic oscillators, classical. Okay, what does this supply for the specific heat and the fluctuations in the energy? Well, gee, those are energy terms that are quadratic in the coordinate, aren't they? So what can we use to calculate the average energy? The equipartition theorem? I mean, one of those terms really is one is really is p square over two m, and so we apply the equipartition theorem. For each harmonic oscillator, we have a position term and a momentum term that give us something quadratic in the energy. So for each harmonic oscillator, we have k t added to the energy, and k added to the specific heat. So for three n harmonic oscillators. The specific heat is 3n k sub b, or 3 times the number of moles times the gas constant. Hmm. This was actually a very old result. It's known as the law of Duong and Petit. Do either of you remember Duong and Petit from high school chemistry or someplace? Duong and Petit lets you estimate the molecular weight of a material from its specific heat, atomic weight. So I have a pure piece of unknown element X, and I would like a rough estimate of its molecular weight, atomic weight. So I measure the specific heat, and I know the specific heat is three times the number of moles times R, and therefore I know about how many moles there are, and therefore I know approximately the atomic weight of the element. I then form the element and its oxide and use the law of definite proportions, except I don't know whether the oxide is unknown O, unknown O2, unknown 2O5, or what. I don't know which oxide it is, but if I know approximately the atomic weight, I can actually work out which oxide it is, and I can get the true atomic weight of the material. And this is how most atomic weights were discovered. <clears throat> okay. <coughs> um, in any event, um, what we have just described is the very classical calculation. And the cal classical calculation says we have a specific heat, but look at 11.2. How does it depend on temperature? It doesn't, correct. It does not depend on temperature. Well, so Einstein chugged ahead, and what Einstein said is, we're going to treat the n atoms as being 3n harmonic oscillators, and we will use Planck's theory for the harmonic oscillator to say that the energy of the harmonic oscillator can be written in the form of 11-4. Now, I have slightly cheated. I put in the zero-point energy, the one-half h nu. Einstein had, did not do this. He didn't know about zero-point energy at this point. He would have just said nh nu. You also want to be a little careful. The reason there are all of these terms 
is that oscillator 1 can have n1 quanta in it, oscillator 2 has n2 quanta in it, and <coughs> oscillator 3n has 3n quanta in it. And so there is an index telling how many energy quanta are in each harmonic oscillator, and in total there are 3n indices. And that lets me write the partition function. And the partition function is equation 11.5, bottom of page 159. And what we say is the partition function is e to the minus beta energy of the system. The energy of the system is the fu a function of the values of n1, n2, and so forth. It's a function of the how many quanta we have in each harmonic mode. The list of states is the sum of all combinations of n1, n2, and so forth. And in equation 11.5, I've used the rule. The exponential of the sum is equal to the sum of the exponentials. Product of the exponentials. Yes. Yeah. Product of the exponentials, which is what I have written. We're, we're just digging you on that typo you had earlier in the book. What can I say? So it's the product of the exponentials. And if we push ahead, we realize that each term of the, the product may be evaluated separately. And each term looks like 11, 6, which is the partition function arising from the ith harmonic oscillator, ith of 3n. Uh, have we seen this before? Yeah, it's the partition function of a harmonic oscillator, which we calculated last time and it's in the previous chapter. And if you do the sum, is the sum hard? No, the sum is a um, geometric series. The sum is n equals zero, is e to the 0x plus e to the 1x plus e to the 2x, or x to the 0 plus x to the 1 plus x to the 2. It's a geometric series and you can add them very easily and you get to 11.7. The 3n power appears because 11.6 is from one atom in one dimensional, and they're actually 3n atoms, and you get 11.7. <coughs> How do you take the average energy given that you're given Q? Minus d log Q d beta, remember? Mm -hmm. And the specific heat is then ddt of that, and I evaluate that. And homework for uh, next Wednesday is proceed from 11.6 to 11.9. Okay. This is all crank turning. And so the Einstein model for the specific heat of a crystalline solid gives the form C in 11.9. And if you take the two limits, you get two results. If you go to high temperature, um, the result goes to a constant. It goes to the law of DeLong and Petit. If you go to a low temperature, this thing the specific heat goes to zero. Now you might ask, why does the specific heat go to zero? Why doesn't it go to a constant? Well, zero is a constant, but that's not what we mean. Here, stacked like a ladder, are the energy levels. Yes? If the system is very cold, the exponential minus beta e is quite large, except for the lowest state, and the system is confined in the lowest state. In order for the system to be in the first excited state, it would have to find at least h nu worth of energy around to hoist it up there, and in a cold system, the h nu of energy is not available. And because it's cold. So the average thermal energy kT is much less than h nu, the separation between states. The population of the first state is down from the ground state by e to the minus 
h nu over kt, which is a big number, and therefore almost nothing is excited. Well, if I change the temperature and almost nothing is excited, I need to add almost no energy to the system to do the exciting because there's nothing happening. Yes? See that? Well, gee, this t name has a technical, this term effect has a technical name, and the technical name is freezing out. You are seeing freezing out of a quantum variable at low temperature because quantization means you have to supply a discrete amount of energy in order to do anything, and the energy is not available. In contrast, for the kinetic energy of an ideal gas, p squared over 2m, there are always states of extremely low p squared over 2m available, and therefore the ideal gas can absorb energy if you heat it. And I need to take a drink for a second. Pardon me. Sorry, my throat is about to go for some reason. <clears throat> okay, so in any event, that is the Einstein theory of specific heat. Now, actually, advancing this theory took a certain amount of intellectual courage, or it took the confidence that you were Einstein, you'd already published the Stokes-Einstein equation, you'd already published the theory of relativity and its extension to electrodynamics. Uh, it was fairly clear you were a sharp fellow and therefore allowed to stick your neck out. And Einstein published. The reason Einstein was at some risk publishing is that he claimed the specific heat was a function of temperature. And the truth of the matter was that at the time he made his claim, there was very little evidence to support this claim. There were a certain number of substances where it was in general known that the specific heat did vary a bit with temperature. There was one material, diamond, where H nu is very large, and therefore the temperature dependence is visible at fairly high temperatures, where the temperature dependence had been followed a decent way down the curve. Yes? Well, <clears throat> um, Einstein, on the basis of limited information, published. However, anyone who wanted to could say, this isn't the Einstein theory, this is some chemically spe chemical specific effect unique to diamond, which of course is enormously harder than any other material, he has this weird crystal lattice structure and all these other things. Diamond is just strange, so the fact that it has a temperature dependent specific heat is just one more proof that diamond is very strange. Fortunately for Einstein, <clears throat> at the same time he published, <coughs> there was a fellow in Berlin known as Nernst. And Nernst had had the bright idea that there was actually a third law of thermodynamics, as opposed to the two that were well known. The third law has several forms, but the relevant one is that the entropy of any system at absolute zero must be zero. And that has the implication that the specific heat has to go to zero at low temperature, too. And so Nernst had this program to validate his thermodynamic thinking of measuring the specific heats of large numbers of materials, especially crystalline elements, over wide ranges of cold temperature. This was very difficult in period. These were heroic experiments. There were a variety of people doing this. They did heroic experiments. Uh, there was, of course, the poor graduate, I think it was a grad student of Kamerling Ons, who was tasked with measuring the electrical conductivity of mercury at low temperature, and he set the experiment up and it ran. I'm sorry, Herr Doctor Professor, something went wrong with the um, electrical linkage and it's short circuited. 
Now, producing liquid helium in period was a significant challenge. You might do a helium experiment or two a week. They were very expensive, even though you carefully recycled. <coughs> and getting, making liquid helium was not something you did in your sleep. So the professor said, okay, try again. I know you're a very good student. The student tried again. I'm sorry, this is catastrophic. It's short-circuited again. And he'd been doing this all along, and the professor said, okay, let me do the study. And he looked very carefully. I don't see a short circuit here. I don't see why you'd get one at low temperature. There wasn't a short circuit. The mercury had become a superconductor. And suddenly the electrical resistance of the mercury lump had gone to zero or very close. It's still hard to measure superconductivity at, even at high temperature. In fact, there is one university, American university, that for a number of years, at least until recently, was claiming that one of their faculty had seen superconductivity at not quite outdoor air temperature, but uh, warm enough that it would be stay superconducting in liquid water. Um, and this result didn't go anywhere, but they didn't exactly back off from it. So in any event, liquid cold making cold measurements were hard, but Nernst and his students persevered. Now the Einstein model gave a shape for the specific heat, and it looks like figure 11-1. And the question is, what does Einstein's specific heat look like if the system gets very cold? Well, you could do a Taylor series expansion, but your other choice is just to look at equation 11-9, which you're going to derive. And you realize that as the system gets very cold, e to the minus beta h nu become, goes to zero, or close. And therefore, in the, the denominator, 1 minus e to the minus beta h nu just goes to 1. If e to the minus beta h nu goes to 0, then 1 minus 0 goes to 1. No, because e to the 0 is 1, not 0. It goes to 0. Uh, what is beta? Come on, one of you must know what one beta is. 1 over kt. So if t goes to zero, what does beta go to? Infinity. Okay. Yes. So e to e the to minus the beta h nu goes to e to the minus infinity, which is tiny, and therefore 1 minus yeah. goes to 1. However, up in the numerator, um, you can't just say, oh, what's it going to do? Well, it's beta h nu squared e to the minus beta h nu. The exponential will always swamp any power and therefore the exponential dominates, and this thing goes to zero at low temperature, and it goes approximately as an exponential. Well, it goes as one over t times squared times an exponential of one over t. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, so it goes to zero, and the form of this is figure 11-1. Well, and for a while, this was no big deal, because experimental data was hardly convincing that specific heats depend on temperature at all, let alone you have a curve of this exact shape. However, experimenters persisted, and eventually became apparent there was an issue. The solution to the issue was found by Peter Debye, the Debye model. The Debye model has two pieces. One is getting a better list of the uh, modes of the system than simply saying there are 3n modes, each of frequency nu. And the other half of the problem is turning this into something where you can do the sum over modes and remembering, gee, there are n atoms, there are only 3n modes. That's important. <clears throat> and therefore, I can calculate the average energy in the specific heat. So what does he do to calculate the, um, the modes of the system? Well, what he does is say, we have a crystalline solid. There are vibrations. What are the normal modes for vibrations? There are sound waves. 
And so we will write down a description of all of the sound waves in the system. And the answer is, if I have a solid that's an L by L by L cube, is that the sound waves must oscillate. And if I have carefully put my cube in a big rigid vise, the sound waves have the property that they must go to zero at each end. They must go to zero at zero. They must go to zero at L. And in between, therefore, since we have to have a half integer number of waves from here to here, what happens to the allowed wavelengths? It quantizes. Yes, they're quantized. And the allowed wavelengths, this is also true, this is the oh, um, driven harmonic oscillator waves on a string. You have to have a half integer number of waves from one end to the other. Or if you have a driver at one end, you must have some a quarter integer number of waves because the driver always is at a maximum of the oscillation. Okay? So the allowed waves have wave vector k in directions x, y, and z. And the um, restrictions on k are that, that it must be n pi over l in wave size. Yes? Of course, the different, of course, there's an nx, an ny, and an nz. But you have these waves. Okay? And we can enumerate them because each normal mode has each its combination of nx, ny, and nz, where n is the half integer number of waves between one end and the other. So far, so good. Now we come to the warning point. It's a notation issue that you're stuck with. N is used in two completely different ways. It's being used here, below equation 1111, to describe the wave. So a given mode of the system has an NX, an NY, and an NZ determined by how many vibrations it has from one side to the other. Yeah? Mm -hmm. However, each wave also has a quantum number n that tells it how many quanta of energy are stored in that mode. And those two n's are not the same. We are good to go again. Okay, so we now have, or say, the solution to the wave equation are waves. There is a wave equation, equation 11-10, that describes the wave, which is exactly the same wave equation that you hopefully derived in physics 4. Well, I can be hopeful. You should have derived in physics 4. And it's associated with that as a speed of sound c. Now, the speed of sound c being simply a number is a slight bit of a cheat. The reason is that if you're actually in a solid, and I have a sound wave going that way, there are actually three different sound waves. There are two sound waves in which the atoms in the wave are moving longitudinally, like this. I'm sorry, I meant transversely. They're moving transversely since the wave is going that way. And there are two transverse waves, and they're perpendicular to each other, two polarizations. The other choice, though, for a sound wave going that way is that the sound wave is a compression wave and the atoms are moving like this. The compression waves and the transverse waves actually do not use the same speed of sound. And if you want to bog down the notation, or if you're doing solid state physics, you go into detail on this. I just note that there is a general speed of sound and we are good enough if we acknowledge that it's C. The importance of C is we have waves. They are traveling in some direction. We have their wave vector and wave length. And therefore, we also know the frequency. And the relationship between wavelength and frequency um, is eventually going to be calculated out. Namely, it is found in 1116 at the bottom of the next page. And the frequency is de determined by the wave vector, the speed of sound, and there's a 2 pi in there. 
And so the long wavelength modes have very low frequencies and the higher wavelength modes have higher frequencies. Okay, so we have said we would quantize and we have generated a list of the modes and the list of the modes is generated by nx, ny, nz, how many maxima or minima the mode has from point to point. All right, now we're going to write the energy of the system, and we do that in 1113. And 1113 says this system has three n harmonic oscillators in it. Each harmonic oscillator has energy n plus a half h nu. However, nu is a function of nx, ny, nz. It depends which mode you're looking at. If you're looking at a long wavelength mode, the frequency is low. If you're looking at a high frequency, a short wavelength mode, the frequency is high. And we have put it, going to put in the relationship between the wave vector and the frequency at some point. <clears throat> Why do we stop with 3n normal modes? <coughs> because 3n is a complete set of normal modes for 3n coupled harmonic oscillators. Well, 3n coupled one-dimensional harmonic oscillators. So that's all the modes there are. The energy is then, each harmonic oscillator has n plus one-half h nu energy. However, n is different for each harmonic oscillator, so you have to label that. Nu, in general, is different for each harmonic oscillator. You have to label that. And therefore, 1113 covers pieces of two lines. And now we are ready to write the partition function. Namely, the partition function is a sum over all states of the system of um, x minus beta e. I'm going to take a shortcut between 11.13 and 11.14. The energy is a sum of terms, so the partition function is a blank of terms where blank is product. If the energy is a plus b, the partition function is a sum over x minus beta a plus b. And therefore, you can write the partition function as x minus beta a times x minus beta b, despite the unfortunate um, <clears throat> typo earlier in the book. A typo that is so transparent that no one ever noticed it until now. Um, okay, and therefore, the partition function is a sum of terms, is now a product of terms, I should say, and the product is the partition function for a simple har single harmonic oscillator. Well, that function is shown in 11.14. Mm -hmm. That is, I've actually written out the single par particle partition function in terms of its dependence on various variables. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the partition function. If you have the partition function, you can calculate the energy, can't you? It's minus dB beta log Q. So you have Q in 1114, and as homework, you will validate 11 15. All right. And now we have these modes labeled by NX, NY, and NZ. And what is done is to change the label. Instead of labeling a mode by how many X or Y or Z oscillations it has, <coughs> we label each mode by its energy, or at least its frequency, though we know E equals H nu. So label by frequency, label by energy, same thing. So what we do is to say we will replace nx, ny, nz by nu, and we have to be a little clever to do that. So 1117 shows you how the frequency of a particular mode is related to its oscillation times nx, ny, nz. Yes? Mm -hmm. and, we, and therefore, 
since it's nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared to the one half, we can introduce a new variable n, which is the distance out from the origin. And this nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared to the one half is simply n. And so 1118 gives you the relationship between the frequency and the number of oscillations of the mode reduced to a single number. Okay, now the number of modes is very large. We have a partition function in 1115, now average energy I should say in 1115, which says the average energy is the energy in each mode summed over all the modes, and the modes are nx, ny, nz go zero to infinity. And what I say is that the nx, ny, nz give you modes that are real close together, yes? And therefore I'm going to replace nx, ny, nz with spherical polar coordinates. And I am going to do this and stay in the first octant when I do so. Do you know what an octant is? Solid. Yes, octant is x, y, and z all great, greater than zero. It's an eighth of all space. Just as a quadrant in a plane is a fourth okay, of yeah, all yeah. space. Yep, yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we do this and we get to equation 11 19. Now you may say, isn't that supposed to be a three dimensional integral there? And the answer is since the direction in space doesn't count, the frequency is only determined by the number n and not the ratio of nx to ny and nz. There's an integral in spherical polar coordinates. And the two angular integrals give you a 4 pi over 4 or something like that. Namely, 4, or 4 pi over 8. 4 pi for a circle over 8 because you're only using one octant. And here is the energy as a function of frequency. Okay. Now, we were, I wrote it in terms of n because I replaced nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared with n. But n determines nu. So I can rewrite 11-19 in terms of the frequency of all of the oscillators. And if I take the, the same approach with the specific heat, I get a formula for the specific heat. What do I do? I took dE dt, that's the specific heat, and I get 11-21. Notice that when I calculate the specific heat, the zero-point energy vanishes. Uh, and we are sort of out of time, so the last thing we have to do is to discuss what the upper bound on nu or n is. We sort of knew what it was for um, nx, ny, and z, because the product of the three bounds, nx, ny, and z, is supposed to give you you can have all combinations of nx, ny, and nz. The product is supposed to give you the total number of modes, which is 3n. And therefore, there is an outer limit on how large nu can be mm -hmm. imposed by the fact that nu corresponds to the, quant the wave vector number n of the nodes, and there are only 3n modes to start out with. We'll do this next time. Class is dismissed.